Hello, and welcome to our webinar, Building Uncertainty Competence, Applying the Entrepreneurial Method. My name is Laurence Schwer from ESCP Business School Berlin campus. I will be your moderator today. As some may already know, today's webinar is part of a series of webinars created by ESCP Business School called Beyond, Beyond COVID-19 Inspiration for Change. In the context of the current crisis, ESCP has mobilized experts and professors from five of its European campuses to develop this series. Our aim is to support you as managers and companies by giving some insights that hopefully will help you better understand and navigate this exceptional situation. In these times more than ever, we are all confronted with a climate of uncertainty for ourselves personally, but also for the organizations that we work for. So today we will focus on how the current COVID-19 crisis forces managers to explore how the field of entrepreneurship can help building uncertainty competence. In this webinar, you will learn what un uncertainty is, how you can deal with uncertainty through entrepreneurial logics, and how you can build uncertainty competence for yourself and your company. I am very happy to have Professor René Mauer from our Berlin campus and Professor Martin Cook from our Paris campus as speakers today. Let me briefly introduce them. René, René Mauer is professor and holds the chair of entrepreneurship and innovation at ESCP Business School in Berlin and is the academic head of ESCP's Executive Master in Digital Innovation and Entrepreneurial Leadership. His areas of expertise is entrepreneurial decision-making in venture and corporate contexts. He co-owns a family business, co-founded a technology startup, and was involved in a variety of other venture projects. For instance, as a partner of the expert network, Effectuation Intelligence. Big welcome to René Mauer. And Professor Hello. Martin Cook is Associate Professor for Entrepreneurship and Strategy at ESCP Business School on the Paris campus. Martin's research interests focus on decision-making under uncertainty, incubation and acceleration and corporate innovation. He supports startups as mentor and helped founding Renaissance Fusion in 2020 a startup aiming to bring fusion energy out of the lab onto the grid. Welcome, Martin. Welcome. So, before we get started, just a quick overview of today's house rules. So, we'll have 30 minutes presentation from our professors, and just feel free to ask questions during the presentation. You can do so in the questions field. And at the end of the presentation, uh, you will have 20 minutes to cover those questions. Also, the webinar is recorded and will be made available on ESCP homepage. Um, during the presentation, we'll be using Mentimeter that some of you might already know to interact with you. So um, just as a start, um, I invite you all to join Mentimeter on www.menti.com using the code 12-73-29. And before we get started with our speakers, I invite you to answer the question, what has become more uncertain for you during the pandemic? Great. Um, thank you, Laurence, for, for kicking us off here. Um, again, here is the contact and the question. Please uh, join us on menti.com. Uh, we'll see our way to actually show you some results with that, with that process. You can find the, the, the data to actually connect to Mentimeter up in that uh, corner here, menti.com, with the code that Laurence already told you. And it's also going to be in the chat box. So please also feel free to go and visited there. 
Um, welcome from, from our side. Um, we are welcoming you, obviously, from, from ESCP Business School uh, and more precisely from the Jean-Baptiste Thay Institute uh, for Entrepreneurship. Um, we are within the school, a hub of uh, about 50 to 60 people um, taking care of all research and program activities around entrepreneurship. Um, and uh, we took the name uh, Jean-Baptiste Say by a French economist who co-founded ESCP, but also was kind of responsible for promoting the term entrepreneur. So you may wonder, why do we talk about entrepreneurship in the COVID crisis? Uh, and uh, I can assure you, obviously, we're not asking you to now actually go and start off all kinds of startups. If you feel like, you can still do, of course, but it's not uh, our, our idea here. What the Say Institute took on as uh, what we call areas of ex expertise or areas of excellence that we are that we are keen on that are important to us, you can see three things on this slide here. One is we believe in entrepreneurship and business, but also beyond. So yes, entrepreneurship is a term heavily connected with the venture phenomenon, but we also believe that it has place in other forms of business. For example, corporate businesses, and even beyond whenever it comes to all sorts of value creation. We also believe that it's strongly important to focus on methods and pedagogy when it comes to entrepreneurship, because it's heavily tied to our understanding of what will be today's topic as well, uncertainty. Um, and it also has uh, lots of psychological aspects to it that are important to understand. That's why we're not only focusing on understanding better methods, but also the pedagogy behind it. And we look at entrepreneurship, that's the third part, uh, as ecosystems for new value creation, in where this taking on of and this coping with uncertainty becomes important. So um, we have a broad view on entrepreneurship, not only starting ventures, but actually coping with and dealing with uncertainty. Hence our topic uh, of today, which is building uncertainty competence, applying the entrepreneurial method. And we have three topics that we want to follow through um, in, this, in this line here. It's uh, understanding and assessing uncertainty, first part and first step, then moving on to uh, dealing with uncertainty, and finally giving a couple of insights on what we think belongs to building an uncertainty competence here. So you can see on in the uh, top right corner um, the, the menti.com um, connections here, and I will move over to see whether we already have some interactions with you here. So um, give me a second to figure this out here. So let's see whether some of you, oh yes, wonderful. Thank you so much for interaction, for interacting with us. Um, the question is, what has become more uncertain certain for you during the pandemic? And you can see in this word cloud um, a couple of the big terms that many of you hit. Um, it's future in general, it's economy, it's work, travel, it's social life, it's consumer behavior, it's sales, it's my trust in future, it's business models, it's human relationships, work in general politics, education, strategy. Wonderful, thanks very much for sharing that. Um, it was important to us to kind of kick you off in that sense, uh, asking you what are, what are your topics that are important to you in these times when it comes to, when it comes to discussing uncertainty um, and also thinking about uncertainty. And I'll move back to my presentation here. So let me start with the first point here. We saw from many of the terms that you were mentioning that uh, there's all kinds of areas that uncertainty has become a topic now. So um, again, when we talk about um, understanding and assessing uncertainty, um, we talk about a field that we are kind of comfortable about. We're talking about it when we talk with and about entrepreneurs. For entrepreneurs, that's kind of normal. But now with COVID and the COVID pandemic crisis, it all hit us basically globally uh, hard over the head and uncertainty came down on us um, in the form of the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, maybe also something that um, Nassim Taleb uh, has been calling a black swan. 
something not very probable, very improbable actually, and still it hit us and not only few of us on the planet, but actually everybody. So the question is, what do we mean when we ask about uncertainty? We didn't prep you a lot when before asking the question now, but still let's look a little bit at what makes sense to think of if we talk about uncertainty. Um, just generally speaking, what we would suggest is um, talking about uncertainty in the sense of not knowing, not being sure, not having the proper information, what to do now to be su successful with it a little bit later. So the question of, okay, I'm in that situation now, what now? One person who has been conceptualizing that a little bit more, uh, and that will help us understand and both assess uncertainty, has been uh, Frank Knight. And Frank Knight, um, interestingly enough, conceptualized uh, his notions of un around uncertainty and its differentiation around uncertainty about 100 years ago. So um, his uh, dissertation kind of wrapped up in a book uh, called Risk, Uncertainty and Profit was actually published back in 1921. Um, so we are now in a time 100 years later where this becomes massively uh, a topic of you know, a, a certain, um, a so, a certain importance right now. And the concept is still old. I give you these, uh, these examples here. Think of decision-making situations where your action will always be drawing out of an urn that you cannot look into. And then it depends on what kind of information that you have before. The game is very easy. I'll al I would always ask you, tell me before what you will pull out. And if the thing that you pull out is exactly what you said you would pull out, uh, you would have it. And we can see three uh, versions of uh, different versions of uncertainty here, starting with certainty, when there are only purple balls in the urn. And I'll tell you there are only purple um, balls in the urn, and I don't lie to you, you can draw one out of it, and you will be certain, you can be certain, that it will be a purple uh, ball here. For risk, it changes a little bit. There are two options in this situation here yellow and purple balls. Um, I would, could even give you the spread. So there's one third purple balls, two thirds yellow balls. And now you could make your own kind of uh, calculations. If you want to actually get a ball, you would maybe want to um, pull out a yellow one uh, to increase the probability here. If you're more into purple balls, you may want to actually, um, you may actually want to get a purple ball out. Sorry about that. Um, and maybe get an insurance against um, drawing out a yellow ball. For the uncertainty urn that we have here, we can actually see that there are lots of balls inside. It's still yellow or uh, purple, but you cannot know what is the distribution of both. So you probably have to draw out of them a couple of times, make some testing, make some, um, some uh, market intelligence here, do some, do some trials to see what could be the spread, to kind of get your own idea about what could be the situation more similar to a risk situation there. This is what Frank Knight put out there as a differentiation of different uncertainty spectra, but he actually had one more, and that's the most interesting one for us here. It's the one of true uncertainty. So this is where, this is where um, Frank Knight actually said, there's one particular playground for an entrepreneur to look at, and this is true uncertainty, when the information is basically zero, you can only draw from an urn, and it will not even help you to have seen the other three urns before, because here's nothing about purple balls, here's nothing about yellow balls, it's only all sorts of different shapes and forms that you can pull out, and it's really truly uncertain. This is what Knight produced as a differentiation of uncertainty, and um, it's interesting for us, uh, because it shows us what, in an extreme way, uncertainty actually means. And it also gives us the hint that entrepreneurship may play a role here. So our, our point of understanding around understanding and assessing uncertainty is we may think of uncertainty coming on a spectrum from a phase, from a situation that we actually may like, uncertainty, um, to all the way to a situation that we call true uncertainty, or even in these days, night in uncertainty, very, very high levels of uncertainty um, that for us show um, where the entrepreneur may come into play. Okay, so we'll move forward and uh, our next point is 
well, how do we how do we deal with uncertainty? Um, and while while obviously we believe that it's very important to classify uncertainty or to know what we are talking about and to to be very precise about what kind of uncertainty uh, we are experiencing. In reality, the boundaries are, are blurry. Uh, it's not so much that there are four distinct types and uh, they are clearly defined and you know where you are. It's a little bit like there is a range of uncertainty going from true uncertainty, uh, um, how, how René just described, to hopefully a situation where you are quite certain or potentially even completely certain. And this is what you also see in the startup world. A lot of startups today, in a lot of pitches, we hear about like how people de-risk their, their venture. Uh, we would say, taking, taking especially the definition from Knight, they are not so much de-risking their venture, because risk is already pretty good, uh, but they are very much de-uncertaining or de-uncertainty their, their ventures, moving from potentially true uncertainty in the beginning uh, to hopefully uh, a situation of uncertainty, of risk, and then certainty. And we have come up with one of our key slides that we use uh, uh, at uh, the Jean Baptiste Institute to explain people a little bit our approach towards uh, entrepreneurship. But here in this, in this webinar, uh, we are aiming much more uh, also at the corporate level so, so it's a way how we structure different approaches, how to deal with uncertain situations. And when you see the slides, it basically goes from high degrees of uncertainty, potentially true uncertainty on the left side, to all the way of certainty or, or very low risk situations to the right-hand side. And we try to somehow put different methods and tools that are out there in the field uh, that you can use in, in different situations. And when you think about it, entrepreneurship, how it started, it was really uh, basically business thinking, business planning, pitching, selling, which is really on the right-hand side. Uh, I remember that there was a big wave of uh, business plan competitions at, at uh, high schools all the way to universities. But we would argue a business plan only makes sense if you are already uh, de-uncertain your situation significantly. That's why we put it really to the right. It's a very important tool and it's good and we're not even saying that's a bad tool, but you need a certain amount of information and especially the linkages between these informations to really make sense out of a business plan. So in the last couple of years, we've seen that a lot of new tools have evolved. People talk about the lean startup. People talk about design thinking. People talk about effectuation, improvisation, bricolage. People talk about art thinking. And we think these methods and tools make sense in different times in different times or in different situations of uncertainty and that's why we, we we put them on this slide what you'll see and what is more important because we are not in the in the game of of selling tools and selling concepts uh, what is more important is that these concepts and tools have certain things in common and these commonalities will get probably emphasize even more towards the left, uh, left hand side. So I quickly go through some of these commonalities. The further you go left, the more you will have a bias towards action. The idea is if you are unable to predict the future, only actions will help you to figure the future out. They have a bias towards collaboration. As you do not control all means, only collaboration will help you to create new means. They have a clear bias towards today. As uncertainty is high, the speed to move forwards matters. So move today instead of planning and move tomorrow. They have a bias towards small interactions, testing and experimenting. They have a bias towards keeping investments and losses low. They have a bias towards agility. And they have a bias towards early customer interaction. 
the sooner you get into interaction with your customer, which very often is the, the one of the parts where uh, high uncertainty comes from, uh, the better. So this is important for us that basically, depending on how you define your uncertainty, you then choose the right tools and concepts that will help you in this situation. And I think companies can learn a lot from what we know from entrepreneurs in this assessment of the right tools. And this is also very important because a lot of people try to sell you a tool, like this is the right tool. If you do a strategy, you have to do the five forces analysis, or if you do entrepreneurship, you have to do the lean startup. Well, we don't believe in that. There is not the one fixed single tool that is the right tool in any kind of situation. It's more, you need to know different kind of tools and adjust your tools to the situation. And this is also a big part in how to really actually build uncertainty competence, which is the next part of our uh, discussion. And Rene will lead you into this discussion. So we've talked about understanding um, and assessing uncertainty and dealing with uncertainty. For us, this comes together in this idea of uh, building what we hear in this webinar call uh, uncertainty competence. Um, and it comes in and we want to discuss it in three building blocks. Um, the first one is supporting multiple decision rationalities. So what we mean by this is that particularly if we look at established companies, um, it's, it's kind of not to be expected that uh, that everybody would be accepting kind of adding another type of rationality here. In fact, what we have now in established companies as rationality very often is one that's very prediction based, very tailored toward optimization for very, very good reasons. Um, and the, the two um, sides that we just showed here in the first two points um, actually show us that uh, there may be, of course, a logic behind the, these tools matching the situation that comes all the way to you could, of course, use tools and choose tools that are not appropriate for certain situations. Um, I can give you one example, kind of being, being responsible for that myself. When I was teaching at Aachen University, which is a technical university, um, we very often had people there who were interested in commercializing new technologies. And commercializing new technologies um, would kind of be a situation that we would probably find a little bit further on the left-hand side of our spectrum. And for quite a good time, um, just as Martin just said, we were still highly focused from a method point of view on business modeling and business planning. So we would give them a business planning workshop when they were in their very early stages of actually trying to commercialize a pretty new technology. And you can see how it would clash there, right? The people would be kind of unhappy with going through all these definitional aspects of precisely describing a target segment of customers when they didn't even know how to wrap up the technology or what kind of problem they would actually be meeting with this technology. So what we need is, and this is what we mean by supporting multiple decision rationalities, we need something like context rationality. We need this process of looking at decision-making situations, looking at projects, assessing them in terms of where are they on the uncertainty spectrum, accepting that uncertainty is a lot more a perceptual issue than something that you can objectively measure with a thermometer. So kind of also get into a group discussion about where is a project when it comes to uncertainty, um, uncer the uncertainty uh, dimension, and then choose a method that is appropriate for that, very, uh, for that context. And that's what we mean by supporting different, um, different rationalities, different decision rationalities here. It's not about exchanging one rationality that has been there before for another one. This is about a complementary set of different rationalities, different methods that belong to different uncertainty contexts. Yeah, but the, the methods and the tools also as we described them or as we showed them in, in, the, in, the, in the slide with the, with the uh, de-uncertainty of, of ventures, the me methods and tools are obviously only the first step. Uh, and you need to know these methods and tools and you need to have them basically in parallel and you need to choose based on your context. But I think the second most important thing is developing method and mindset expertise. And with expertise, 
uh, what, what we mean with expertise is you actually have to apply those things. Uh, it's, it's not good enough to know these things, but it's about the application. And it's so the application of the methods, but also the, the creation of your mindsets to do so. And, and this is what we see again and again when we work with uh, executives in, in companies is on the one hand, it's an easy sell to give them new methods. Uh, everybody likes methods and tools. It's much harder to make them apply these methods. And when they apply them, we very often see that people fall back into, into their, their uh, typical behavior, which is like, okay, now I applied it, now it has to go wrong, uh, it has to go the right way. And we say, no, you, you have to apply these methods, but you also have to apply this mindset of, well, I have to explore it. I have to think about the right kind of tool in the right kind of situation. And I have to be willing, I have to be willing to try things out because although we showed you buckets, I already said it's more a continuum. So where exactly are you and which tool you should use is not always clear. And you have to create a common understanding in your team, in your organization, but then you have to be willing to try and reflect. And I think that's the most important. And that's what we mean with developing the method and mindset expertise. Third point here is uh, making room. And here we're looking particularly at uh, both leadership and work environment. Um, as we said before, um, there are many, many organizations already paying a lot more uh, attention to topics around change, innovation, um, and these and these topics uh, that uh, are of higher uncertainty and that require a different a different approach here. Um, still, there's room for development at that, at this point. And I want to just quickly um, and talk about it in this in this idea about about leadership. So, um, if we go into a particularly established organization, we can still find entrepreneurs, uh, right? Um, what we would call them is uh, intrapreneurs. So these are people who are uh, driven to uh, drive new initiatives, um, although they have this very uh, established and sometimes maybe even uh, a rigid context around them. Um, the way I've been talking to um, intrapreneurs is, again, usually very driven people um, who may also be talking a little bit about a tough life at some time, uh, at some point in time, um, when it comes to kind of pushing through certain um, hierarchy levels uh, and barriers that they're looking at. So the importance here is to make room for that. And why not just institutionalize, systematize that just a little bit more, um, even in uh, established organizations that have been um, running um, on, uh, on a kind of standard management paradigm um, so far. Um, and the way uh, this, can, this can work out is by actually acknowledging that spectrum from a leadership perspective, right? Um, and then also to empower the um, the uh, employees who are interested and willing to actually engage in this uh, in this context rationality of maybe also trying out different approaches and different methods um, on the left hand side of the spectrum that we were showing to you. That doesn't come easy. It also means a lot uh, um, a lot of challenges for the for the uh, for leadership, um, particularly when it comes to, for example, thinking and rethinking KPIs. What are actually KPIs on that left-hand side of the spectrum? Um, also, when it comes to communicating within the organization, that there may be people running around with a totally different approach to things um, and telling everybody else that this is actually still okay. And even beyond that, that they're inviting them to you know, be good partners for them in the organization. Um, lastly, we're literally meaning rooms. So uh, we have learned a lot now in the in the COVID crisis, what it actually means to be in rooms that we're not that much used to working out of uh, in, uh, in contrast to actually going to our organizations and working in our offices. So there's, there's a lot of space actually that can be rethought in the way of how should that look like? Uh, how can spaces, how can rooms actually look like when they are supposed to support this second, this left-hand side um, of the approaches and methods that we were looking at here? So a couple of layers where making room uh, makes a lot of sense um, and where we're basically, again, um, encouraging 
leadership encouraging organizations, companies to think about establishing a second somewhat new operating system to the very successful one that they already have been running um, for, for quite some time here. Yeah, uh, so let me quickly wrap up um, because obviously in a webinar of 45 minutes, um, you have to establish a certain ground and, and you can only go, uh, go so deep, but we would like to invite you to now take this conversation, this discussion into the direction that you think uh, you need more information or you would like to ask questions. But on a high level, what we try to achieve in this half an hour, which we, we, which we only took for, for the presentation was, well, in order to actually talk about these things, we have to understand and assess uncertainty. And I think the classifications by Frank Knight uh, are very useful to, to create a common understanding of what uncertainty really is to create some measures, potential measures. How do, we, how do we measure the degree of uncertainty? What are even, what are the criteria? The next uh, thing we wanted to establish is that there are many methods and tools already out there. So it's not about creating new methods and tools. Maybe we have to, well, but, but that's not our purpose here. But, but it's also to show we already have quite a bit, but you as leaders, you have to be capable of choosing the right method and tool in the right moment. And in the third point, we wanted to discuss very briefly, well, what, how could that look like in an organizational setting? So not so much in a venture, but what, how, what, what do companies now have to do? And we briefly talked about the three elements uh, of building uncertainty competence, which is supporting multiple decision rationalities, but also developing the method and mindset expertise. And last but not least, really making room for leadership and work environment to, uh, to really uh, deliver upon those. Um, all of this is captured in a, in a recent paper, which will come out hopefully very, very soon as part of the ECP impact series, uh, where we have more than 60 papers in the pipeline, all discussing the impact of the COVID crisis and how we as business school uh, can potentially help uh, with our expertise. Uh, so that's coming out next. Uh, just uh, keep on uh, looking on our website. And we would now love to open the floors to your questions uh, and to go deeper into the, those areas which are important for you. Just, uh, just real quick, um, uh, while we're doing the Q&A, um, uh, please also feel invited to um, to go back to uh, Mentimeter, I will actually be activating a another um, another quick survey there uh, that we can look at jointly at the end of our session. Um, but yes, happy to engage now with your questions and comments. Yes. Thank you very much, uh, Martin and René, uh, for your presentation. Uh, we already have a couple of questions uh, from the audience. One is coming from uh, Francois, who's asking if you could give us some specific examples of how these methods might be implemented in some companies. Do you have some concrete examples on that? Sure. I, should I start? Um, I can. Uh, I can give you a quick example of um, of uh, assessing it. Right. So um, I can. I can um, easily remember one one project where I was actually invited to a company to um, to go through um, what some of these methods on the left hand side. Right. This was actually the the, the scope of the of, of the engagement there. And um, uh, the idea was that I came in with was uh, let's actually use something like an hour or two of a whole day to discuss uh, uncertainty, what it is, how you may want to assess it. And then um, actually let's use the other six hours or what it was to actually go through the methods and do a workshop. We ended up actually spending almost the whole day uh, working with them on uncertainty because they really got excited about it. And what we did is we gave them a, a set of questions that can 
can actually start a conversation with, for yourself. You can start a conversation with yourself, but then you can also uh, put that uh, conversation to a team. And you can literally list all the projects that you have. This was a change management context. Uh, and discuss in your teams which are the ones that are a little bit further to the right or a little bit further to the left on that spectrum. Um, and they they enjoyed it in a way, in a way I'm saying so much, because what they found out very quickly is that their individual perceptions about where the, all these projects were on the spectrum were already very, very different. So you would see people going like, why would you think this is all the way to the right? And in that sense, quite certain. Um, I actually don't see it at all. To me, it's really, really uncertain or vice versa. And so there, the value for them already came with this with this assessment activity that they actually you know took on as a as a to them new tool uh, and a new approach to look at their various projects maybe maybe i add to that or from a different perspective i i did quite some work on design thinking uh, and with companies which ended up in a in a publication for mit sloan where we looked at how companies implement design thinking and uh, going beyond the article, which looks at different things, but uh, our point here would be uh, what, and, or let's put it that way, what, what we see in companies very often is that they are fascinated by a new tool like design thinking. Uh, then they hire a couple of people, they read up on it, and then they make a huge rollout, and then everybody has to do design thinking. Uh, and obviously, uh, some people are excited about it. Other executives say like, oh, it's just another fad and now we all have to do design thinking and what, what would be next? Uh, and our point here is exactly the, the opposite. It's not about rolling out a new tool and making sure that everybody uses it all the time. It's more rolling, creating the expertise and mindsets so that people can actually then choose the right tool in the appropriate situation. Um, so, so that that's that's a little bit different, but but of course, and maybe that's the last point. Of course, sometimes that's very difficult in large organizations because they like to be aligned and they like to have processes, and then of course they want to uh, uh, use certain tools at certain point in time, and then they have a process again, uh, which absolutely makes sense if you have certainty. It just doesn't make sense if you have high uncertainty, uh, and that's that's I think what we are trying to get across. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we have a few more questions. Um, maybe some clarification question from Paolo. Uh, he's asking, is the idea that you want to express that under complete uncertainty, we should move from complete rationality to a sort of flexible rationality? For example, a sort of creativity mediated by rationality? What is your idea on that? Yeah, that's a very, very, very good question. Actually, I'm trying to do uh, quite a bit of research around that right now um, to figure that more out. Um, so uh, what is interesting to me is that uh, when you come to, a to the word rationality, uh, it, it's basically very, very dangerous to go down this path, right? Because uh, very quickly, people would think, oh, the right-hand part, the predictive part, that's rational. All the stuff that you're doing on the left-hand side is irrational. And that's what we're kind of trying to work against from our entrepreneurship perspective quite a little bit, right? So I very much like the flexible rationality part. I was using context rationality, right? Kind of a meta rationality. So let's let's try to, although it's highly, um, it's highly perceptual, uh, let's try to kind of assess the uncertainty degree and then make an informed choice about which kind of uh, method to use. So I call that context rationality. Uh, other people are calling that, uh, and I'm talking about dear colleagues here in Berlin, uh, Gerd Gigerenzer and uh, the group around him, they're talking about ecological rationality, which again, you know, has all kinds of uh, additional uh, connotations that uh, and connections that people make with this term. Um, but I actually do like um, the term um, flexible rationality. I think on the left hand side, what it comes down to is um, it's a lot more about letting things emerge and applying heuristics decision makings, right? So uh, heuristics decision making, which and I, I usually see that as the big issue and the big challenge when I go to uh, to um, more established, more traditional corporate managerial structures. Uh, that a big point in accepting that second operating system or that complementary logic there uh, lies in the fact that 
the, the other one, the one on the right hand side of the spectrum is quite in the mindset of optimizing, right? While on the left hand side, it's not at all about optimizing. It's a lot more about satisfying, about letting stuff emerge and being good enough solutions. And obviously there's a, there's a tension because as you can see, we're also saying that at some point you want to switch, right? You want to kind of start here, let stuff emerge by satisfying heuristics, easy decision-making rules, and then move over to, um, to, to stages where the, the project becomes more crisp, becomes less uncertain. Uh, and at that point, you can also apply those those tools that are tailored to and uh, that are coming in that mindset of optimization uh, and and prediction. Yeah. I hope that somehow. I also want to just to reinforce this. Uh, our idea is really that all of these tools are rational. Uh, they are rational in the situation uh, because there are two types of mistakes. Uh, mistake number one would be um, I just try things out, although I could have known. Well, that's bad. If I could have known, I should try to know. Uh, but there's also mistake type two, which is I read up on everything. I delay decisions because I think I will know, but the situation is just not to know. I, it's highly uncertain. It's true uncertainty. So I delay decisions trying to find the data. I can't find the data. So it would have been way better, much more rational to try something and then move my way forward. So these type, two types of mistakes, obviously this is very, very hard to say. And by the way, which I think is the most interesting part, and that's also where entrepreneurship comes into, knowledge is not dispersed equally. So for one person, it might be a highly uncertain situation. For another person, that situation might be certain because he has certain insights and knowledge that the first person doesn't have. Uh, which, which makes this situation, and sometimes, sometimes, and that's what entrepreneurs do, right? They sometimes exploit their superior insights. Uh, the question is, how did they create these insights in the first place? Uh, but, but that's that's exactly so. So I would, I would, I love the question, and and I love this flexible rationality because it's not rational versus irrational. It's more what is rational in a certain situation. Absolutely, yeah. Great, thanks a lot for your insights. Uh, we have a few more questions, one from uh, Corinne in Paris. Um, can you tell us a bit more about art thinking and is it adapted to high uncertainty? What should I, this one? Yeah, we, we put it, obviously, we put it really, really towards uh, the left, so, so high uncertain uh, situations, because fundamentally, uh, what, I mean, there is, I thinking is, is, is it probably as a term rather new, and there are, they are uh, there is a, one within our schools, there is Sylvain Bureau who, who created our own methodology around art, uh, art thinking, which is called, uh, and, and, uh, and, uh, and also, uh, basically a format which he calls improbable, where he works with executives uh, on, in to create a highly uncertain situation, which is the creation of a piece of art, and leads people through the creation of a piece of art. And they learn different ways of approaching this highly uncertain project. Uh, so yes, this is true. This is really towards the left really in high, high uncertainty because it's not about optimizing. It's really about fundamentally, you could almost say it's about questioning your questions. It's really to go deeper and to understand what's driving you, what is driving these questions. So, so yes, our thinking would be one of the methods we would, we would recommend and we would try and we would work with people on in highly uncertain situations. Okay, thank you. Um, maybe putting this question a bit more in perspective, like how do how do I actually know when to use which methodology or two? 
Well, I, I think that comes uh, probably back to uh, to my statement uh, before, right? Um, it would be so nice to have that thermometer, right? Putting it into the decision-making situation or into a project situation, and then it goes like, you know, low uncertainty, mediocre uncertainty, high uncertainty. Um, and unfortunately, that doesn't work. And it doesn't work because, as Martin just uh, just uh, nicely stated um, in that comment before, is it's it's perceptual and, and information can be, you know, can be very diversely spread. So um, it, can, it can easily be, and it was exactly in the situation that I was um, explaining before um, with that company that we were working with, where, uh, where people already find value in discovering uh, how different the other one, maybe even the same team, um, thinks about uh, the uncertainty connected with the project, right? They are not, they have not been used discussing it in that way. Um, also because, uh, you know, questions and vocabulary was missing in a way um but then uh, they saw value in understanding oh please explain me you know why do you think this is actually totally plain vanilla why is that so straightforward for you because i think this is really one of my uncertainty situations where i do not know what we should do now to be successful just a little bit later right so in terms of in terms of assessing it the process is one that involves lots of communication, right? So it, it needs to heavily build on communication because you don't have the thermometer. So it's socially constructed, right? In the group that's supposed to be tackling that issue, that project, um, that, that task, um, you may be able to come to a somewhat agreement of where you are on the spectrum, which then should give you the opportunity to very clearly decide for an approach. Um, and when we do, and we do, of course, also um, also studies uh, with startups uh, as entrepreneurship uh, people, um, we can see that even in startups, this perception changes over time, right? So they maybe have a certain perception. Usually they start out with, oh, kind of highly uncertain, and they start out with the methods on the left-hand side of the spectrum. Um, and towards the end, we also see that they kind of exchange it to uh, more emphasis on the right hand side of the spectrum so business modeling business planning and all what you all saw in that in that graph there um but that in in the in the meantime you also see some oscillation there right so we have a study where we can actually see how people get into a certain situation maybe some new information comes their way maybe a shock hits them maybe assumption that they were working on uh, doesn't prove sound um, and it changes the perception in the in the managing team then changes uh, and they kind of get into this trouble of oh what do we do now and you also can see how they're switching the rationality so they're going to another uh, method set of doing that so answering your question i think it's a, it's a socially constructed communication based uh, process yeah maybe maybe to just quickly add i think I think the thermometer sounds nice, but it would be actually counterintuitive in our opinion, because uh, already the, the value is in the discussion, the value. Th this is typically something you, you don't do on your own. Huh? You, do, you do it in a startup in your team, or you do it in a business in your, in your management team, in your project team. So, so we, we hope that our, our approach already helps you to, to lead this discussion. Uh, Obviously, you then have to go a lot deeper. I mean, there's obviously there could be uh, customer uh, uncertainty, technology uncertainty, market uncertainty. I mean, you could break it down into different kinds of uncertainty. And probably there are really good questions. In, in the paper, we will, we will also link to a couple of questions. For example, like are the goals well-defined well and specified? Uh, is the information provided unambiguous? Can the future consequences of decisions be, be uh, um, predicted? Is the environment constant or is it uh, changing frequently? So, so you, there are a set of questions that might help you, but, but it's really the process uh, which is uh, uh, valuable in our point of view. So would that mean that basically you don't know if it works until you tried it? Yeah, I, it, it basically, what, yeah, it would it would mean that there is a there is a there's a process of approaching the situation where you try to basically see how uncertain the situation is, choose the right methodology, move forward. But of course, with every I mean that that should be maybe we have not not pointed this out enough uh, uh, enough. 
But of course, there is no learning without reflection. So if you just, I mean, we have a we have a high bias towards action. But if it would be action pure only, then of course the question is where where does the learning take place? So for us, equally important is whatever you do, you then have to reflect upon well, what have we learned? What have we gained? Did we did we really move forward with this action or did we move lateral? And and then because basically what we what we said with the second point is we want to build an uncertainty expertise uh, and this expertise obviously will become you will become better with with doing it reflecting upon it doing it again reflecting upon it i mean that's the that's obviously the underlying uh, logic behind it Maybe just as, an, as one addition. Um, so it, it was interesting also working with a uh, with another company where um, where basically um, management of an innovation area came to us and said it's also kind of hard for us because you know now we kind of set up this framework where people can do innovation projects, right? And um, we kind of tailored it that way that it comes with less or very different KPIs, right? So more freedom. So now everybody is in the company is coming our way and saying, uh, hey, could you fund this innovation project of mine? Um, and I really need it to be an innovation project because you know, I need freedom to actually uh, operate and do my stuff here. Um, and of course, there's a certain competence needed also in the, in the area of uncertainty and uncertainty competence, um, because of course, you know, people will come your way um, and saying, hey, this is an innovation project. But if you look at it, it's basically a project where it's about you know buying for new furniture for some new building, right? Where you could say you know um, let's let's have a little bit of an uncertainty assessment workshop or seminar here, right, on this project because it may not be exactly uh, where it is, right? So so it even comes on different levels, right? So of course on the leadership side you also need to develop that to be able to kind of confront the people who are driving initiatives to have an informed discussion with them about where they are. Okay, thank, thanks a lot. Maybe just one last question uh, from uh, Celine. So what would you say is the role of intuition? How and how is intuition impacted um, by, by, by these methods and putting in place the, the, the uncertainty competence? I mean, we Maybe I, I, I quickly, just very quickly, I'm, I'm, not, an, I'm not an expert on intuition, but uh, I would say intuition, I mean, intuition is very close to heuristics. Uh, and intuition can be, I've done it in the past uh, this way, I, I'll try it again, or I've been successful, or I'll go for, and intuition is also some, sometimes uh, you see somebody else do something and go like, okay, let's try it as well. Um, so intuition is 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 perfectly in high uncertainty. I, I would say intuition would be one of the methods and one of the tools. Ab absolutely fine. But no intuition without reflecting afterwards. Like okay, where this where did this in intuition came from? Like can I can I locate that? Did it really help me? And 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 how did it work out? But yeah, I mean this is this is this is something. Uh, I think we need to uh, actually. I, I think we need to develop a certain intuition competence in the sense of like quite, like asking these questions because because it should also not be an excuse uh, by saying like I just tried. Yeah, I I just tried. Okay, that's fine. No, that's fine. Be based on your situation, but what have you tried? Why and where did you get? That would be my my. Uh, questions. Yeah, just uh, nicely stated. Just, just adding again, uh, it's actually a current research project because it's a very interesting, uh, interesting question there. Um, and in that sense, uh, it's not done yet. It's not, uh, it's not finished. But um, what we see is interestingly enough is that um, people who are more okay with making decisions also intuition based uh, are people who are also more more adapt to choosing methods on the left side of the spectrum, which I think is an interesting uh, observation. Of course, if you look at intuition and people say, hey, I make intuit intuition based uh, decisions here, that doesn't immediately mean that the outcome is good, right? So there may be people who actually 
do intuition based decision making, but actually don't have the proper or good intuition, right? They, they just think they have the, um, they have it. And then others who actually have that intuition in the sense of really knowledge that they don't really know where it comes from, but they have it. And that's how they make the decisions, right? And they also lead to good decisions. I think that's the one that we actually mean when we talk about intuition, right? But um, we definitely can see, and that's kind of a little piece of evidence here that the ones who are more okay with uh, using intuition for their decision-making also are more okay with losing with using uh, um, methods on that left side of the spectrum thanks a lot so go for the knowledge-based intuition <laughs> rather than the other one Absolutely. well uh, thank um, you so much i think we're running out of time now thank you for these uh, very uh, insightful uh, discussions and uh, thanks for joining us also today. Thank you, Rene and Martin. Um, I hope that everyone enjoyed the session and that Florence, you maybe, feel um, ready to just try to... out some of the... Florence, just if I, may, um, um, I, I just want to share quickly um, the, the results of the survey um, before people go out. Oh, yeah, so sure. we, asked the, we asked the three questions. Um, so let me, quickly, let me quickly set that up here. Um, as we said, we would ask you questions about about uncertainty competence and or your view on that um, i hope you can see it now um, so we asked uh, uncertainty competence is a new topic to me is something i find important to develop further is a topic that receives attention in my company um, and we can see that it's uh, you know it's actually a topic that's not entirely new to our audience which is wonderful to see and wonderful to uh, to learn about um, we can see that um, all of you are interested or many of you are interested in actually uh, developing that further. So um, that's that's um, also a nice feedback because um, obviously this is something that maybe because of COVID context or even beyond that, um, we uh, you can see uh, of being of value to um, yeah, to add uh, as competence to your competence set. Um, and then also, you know, at least quite, uh, quite for me on the positive side, uh, is it a topic that receives attention in my company? Um, it's not on the strongly disagree side, it's somewhere in the middle as well. So uh, as we said before, it's definitely, it's definitely a topic that has um, gained more and more attention, um, even before COVID when it came to, you know, globalization issues um, and digitization issues. Um, so I think this is a, um, this is great feedback to us um, that uh, this may have been an interesting topic to share with you and uh, also thank you from our side for being with us and also asking these wonderful um, and very insightful questions here. Yeah, thanks a lot. I think we should um, have this poll again in six months because I hope that some of you feel ready to try out some of the entrepreneurial methods and tools um, to deal with and also to reduce uncertainty in, in the future. Also, if you if you want to know more, of course, feel free to get in touch with us. And now that we are getting close to the end of the webinar, uh, I just want to um, take the chance and give you an overview regarding the next dates uh, of our webinar series. Uh, I think um, there's a... René, can you just share the, the last slide with the overview? There it is. You see it? Yeah, thanks a lot. So basically that was today the fifth uh, webinar of our series and the next one will take place on the 9th of June at um, 5 p.m. It's on virtual collaboration, creative opportunity or trendy affliction with Marie Taillard and Daniela Loup. So thank you everyone for joining us. We uh, hope that to see you again on one of our next webinars. Take care and have a nice day. Bye-bye. Thank have you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.